What's up, people? This is episode 150 of the Option Podcast. Got a lot of volleyball to cover. We got some juniors to cover. We got some AVP Phoenix to cover. Um, I don't know. Is there a life after volleyball? We're going to find out. This is episode 151. Brian McDermott, the episode starts right now. What up, Brian? What's going on, man? Good to see you. It's number six. <laughs> number 151, baby. Appearance number six from my revolving guest, from my highly intelligent, uh, if I don't, if it ain't about juniors, I don't care type person, Brian McDermott. What's up, man? What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. It's, uh, things are good right now. It's no. been, it's been a crazy, it's been crazy for everyone. But uh, I keep telling people, if you've seen the movie Shawshank, I've been crawling through the tunnel. And I, I really do see the light at the end of it. So uh, a lot of good things going on. Mm -hmm. Been been taking a little bit of a breather after the, the summer working with the kids. But um, this is the first year that I'm uh, in years that I've been getting out to some high school matches to, you know, kind of rub elbows with coaches and support the kids in our program. So, no, it's I'm, I'm in as, for all the episodes we've done. This is probably genuinely um, the, the best place I've been. In. So how you yeah. doing, man? Well, I, it's funny that you mentioned Shawshank Redemption because I have a friend of mine who's kind of down. He had like a, a volleyball breakup and a girlfriend breakup at the same time. I mean, so he don't he don't get to pick one. He, he's suffering both. And I basically mentioned Shawshank Redemption. I said, you don't want to be the guy who turns off the movie before the end. Right. Like you, you can go through this movie, right? All that's the a great. Coaches are thieves. I, I, I really like that statement. I've never heard that before. Well, you, but that's a well, that's good a great artists point. create, but great artists steal. So if I can, you know, we're going to steal away, <laughs> dude. I mean, I'm, I'm good. But um, yeah. You, but my ex-wife was got, uh, watching Shawshank Redemption with me and she's she um, couldn't take it anymore. You know, he, he barred some rope. We thought he was going to hang himself and this and that. And, and and she's like, I can't watch this anymore. And I was like, dude. Five more minutes. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. You can't leave now. I said. After, Fast forward if you haven't seen yes, Shawshank and you're going to see it because after, that's such a good movie. If you watch movies, it's must see. But, as far yeah. as best movies of all time, I mean, how could you leave that out? Like for top five or whatever. Uh, uh, past, past or present. It's so cleverly uh, written. It's uh, the casting was excellent. One of the best narrators in the business, if, if not the best narrator in the business. And Tim Tim Robbins, Time to Shine. You know that whole I don't know what I know I know something you don't but if you stick with me you'll find out type stuff I mean a great great movie so yeah. we are look listen guys this is episode 151 I decided that I need to be in full uniform if I'm going to show this man some respect put some respect <laughs> on this man's name he is the founder of Progression Beach Volleyball this is Brian McDermott we're gonna get into some lightning rounds in fact let me set up this 60 second clock like nothing happened oh boy <laughs> hey we did this last time it was a hit dude. I, I, I got well, I think everyone liked it because it kept us on the track, you know? <laughs> it did, because you know I could go up somewhere else. I mean, dude, we, I just took Shawshank Redemption and drove us both well, off we the done volleyball two and a half, three sunset. Hours, yes. You know, so it's it's good. You know, I got a hard stop at uh, noon your time, so yeah, 90 me minutes for us is it's, yeah. it's a good dose for everyone. Yeah, so, me too. Yeah. I, I mean, I need I got new editing software program, and I have to, I have to understand it using this this episode. So, nice. so actually let's let's start something a little bit quasi into your into your wheelhouse but it could also apply to adults okay um there uh coaches and players on a general level understand volleyball it comes in six fundamentals uh, uh basic fundamentals passing digging serving blocking um hitting and those are six when i forgot digging, <laughs> digging yeah so and serve receives those are kind of yeah. six, i guess yep yeah, like lobs, passes, serve, receive. So my question, the first debate question, actually, let's set up our clock. Oh, uh, there it is. Um, what is the most difficult fundamental as a juniors coach for your kids to pick up? What's one of the things that, they're every, they're, you know, they're learning all six fundamentals. Of course, they're learning things like team play. They're learning the, the other things from the neck up. Sure. Um, what's the most, what's fundamental do you find your kids uh, take the longest to pick up? I think passing for all human beings is probably the toughest. I mean, think about it. What other skill in life are you supposed to get hit with your upper body by something, angle it with your upper body, but as the 
object moves on you, you need to use your legs to adjust, right? Like I think what a lot of people do when they pass, even if they've got a good platform, when the ball moves, they go to meet it, but they'd always think about shaping it to, you know, the target, right? And it's hard because you have a very little amount of time to recognize when a ball's tailing one way or the other. And, and to train someone to tighten their upper body to a spot and use their legs to make the adaptations, I, I think it's just human nature. I've never met someone that when they first started developing that skill, didn't use their upper body to change their contact on their upper body. So, um, you know, there's, there's challenges to every skill, but I think passing – that there's so few things you throw a football or a baseball, you know, you've somewhat done some overhead work, you know, setting a ball kind of like shooting, obviously different with the wrist contact, but, but passing um, to, to, to be getting hit with something and shape it somewhere. I just think that there's not a lot of parallels with anything we do, whether it's another sport or, or another skill. Yeah. Well, I mean, out of the six fundamentals, we got to give them all their equal respect, all right, before I answer this question, right? Setting is one of the, I think sometimes the best way to get better at setting is to set. It's like push-ups, right? Just do push-ups and you get better. Passing, you got to pass at a specific target for indoor and this and that, and sometimes on the beach just high enough where you keep your court vision, I get that. Uh, blocking, trying to stay off the net. Digging, oh my God, that thing's coming at me really fast. But for me, the most difficult fundamental, actually that takes the longest to teach, is the serve. <laughs> it's the serve. Really? I'm not. Ta- I'm not talking about serving a balloon into a general area of, of real estate that that's actually bigger than my apartment in New York. Okay, I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about serve to space. I'm talking about dis- finding ways to disrupt people's people's defense, uh, or, or offense, and serve and serve receive. Um, disrupt their natural order of things, and at the same time keeping it in. Do you know what I call it when I want my kids to serve competitively and, and, and keep the ball in? It's called pressure. <laughs> so kids have to be able to understand the pressure. Pressure and sometimes conquering that pressure is is the seems like the simplest thing and it's the one thing we teach we find ourselves in practice uh, spending the least amount of time on. So that's fascinating. Like I'm not judging it, no. but I'm just fascinated because I I would if you said Brian, what do you think the easiest fundamental? You would have said the serve. I would have said serving, and, and I agree with you. Like to this day, like you just yesterday. So I played yesterday. I haven't been playing much at all. And, and the one thing that I feel has helped me stay competitive, even when I'm like, I know I'm not close to the level I should be at. Right. But, but, you know, being able, it's not just about serving location, but I don't think we do enough to teach people about serving different depths, serving different heights, right? Like Shara Harris, I'll always remember watching her at a Florida tournament. It was a strong wind one way. And before every match, she would go to the side with the wind with her, which is technically typically the bad side. And she would practice that high loopy ball that would land within a couple feet of the back line. And it was brilliant because two things, one, it's, it's not that difficult to hit once you train it. Right. And B now, you know, well, while you think with the wind against you, it's an advantage. Well, they have to back up because they got a forearm pass it. Right. So now you've got hitters that have to travel further from their passing location to where they're actually attacking the ball. And, you know, I feel that that teams are their most deadly when they're at the net. Well, now you got the wind pushing against their pass harder. They have to pass further against the wind, right? If their pass isn't far enough up, now they've got a set um, from off the net. And, and you know, I don't know how much you teach with stuff like this, but something that's kind of Not been enough. an epiphany. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this summer, something that I kind of – I was picking up on it in my group in the spring, and this summer I really started coaching it. It's helped defensively. So – I think, and you watch the AVP and you'll notice it. When a hitter gets a good set, but it's coming from behind them off the net, you know, if you watch these these side panels, you see the pros are really good about letting the ball get to them and then following it in. Right. But there's so many times where I don't get, like, that ball has to travel. And if it's coming down diagonally, like, hitting airs mostly come at high-level players, I think, because they get a ball from a tough angle, it's a good set but they, they try to hit on top of it and they either put it in the net because they get on top of it, but it's just too hard to, to find that sweet spot or they, they break their wrist because they got to get it over the net and it goes long. So um, learning how to serve a ball high and deep to put pressure on a team versus just, I think a lot of people think with pressure, like pace, jump serve, top, you know, standing or jump float. Um, I, I think about Greg Maddox as a pitcher, like he won 300 games, and, and the guy rarely threw, I don't think he threw over 90, but his location was great. And, and the toughest pitch 
to hit is the one you're not expecting. The toughest serve to pass is the one you're not expecting. So, yeah, I, I think teaching players as a server, you know, to get good technique to get it over the net, but also teaching them, you know, how to follow through on a ball to be able to change left, right, center, to be able to change their contact point in their elbow. So, like, the higher I want it to go, the earlier I contact, mm -hmm. the flatter I want it to go. I'm going to drop for this. The flatter I contact, right? Like, when we're aiming for a spot on the other side, teaching your kids or, and your players, like, you're not aiming for a spot on the other side. You're aiming for a spot on the ball. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm a math nerd, so I, maybe it's just that. But I, I've always felt serving is the one thing that the other side can't manipulate. Um, you know, it, it's just you and the ball. So it, it's definitely, I think for younger kids that don't have a lot of experience with it, to your point, yeah, you need a lot of patience. And it's really hard for some of these coaches that, you know, have a 6th, 7th, 8th grade team that try to teach 12 kids that are brand new at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I can get a kid one on one, even if they're really raw, um, I've had kids that take, you know, maybe a month or two, but I've never had a kid that really was willing to put the time in, not just physically, but trying to understand why they make it, why they miss it, right. um, that over time wasn't able to, to get that. And with passing, I think for some kids, it's a lot harder to train their eyes on the height and the speed. Um, and, and the fact that, to you know, your point, we want to put pressure so if you've got a kid that's trying to pass and every single serve they're getting is coming differently uh, versus when they toss themselves, every toss is the same. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's why I have that answer. But that's, like I said, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about um, that. Well, it's, not it's, it's always going to be the endless debate between serve and serve receive uh, at, at every level, right? At the juniors level, he who serves king, right? At the, even all the way to the Enduro Olympics where the serve is, is, is as elegant as a, fa as a baseball fastball. Uh, um, well, not as fast, but as elegant. Uh, sure. um, think about this, right? The U.S. national team, right? In the Olympics, served out 14 times. They lost 3-0 at Argentina, right? Uh, you don't have to be uh, an Olympian or like this longtime coach to conclude that if you miss 14 serves, you're probably not going to win unless you're really, really good. But also on the other side of that argument, consider the Olympic finals, game five, uh, Russia against France, right? Russia, I don't even think missed more than one service error. And if Russia is not making service errors, they usually win. But France was passing dimes. France earned right. that goal like a mother. I couldn't, you wouldn't believe how, I mean, they, they're like a bunch of queens out there from, uh, you know, just the platform. Sure. And, and so that's always going to be the, the endless argument argument and I, I i'm glad because we both answered in our own way but it leaves it out there for people to speculate leave it in yeah. the comment section you know guys you know make sure you subscribe too make sure you hit that bell <laughs> because for some reason algorithms don't like me but i'm still getting my viewership anyway so patience man so well, yeah. progress isn't always linear so no but no and, and you know you bring up an interesting point like at the higher levels and, and i think about you know not even just international but even just like high level open level ball in the area almost every big upset you see stemmed from someone putting on great service pressure. Right. I think about in 2014, I, I lost a pool play match to, to O'Malley and Schmack who great players. But at that point, you were paper, expected that to beat was, them. that yeah. was probably like, not a rude way. But that was probably from a, from a odds perspective, the most, I, I should have won that match. I didn't, but those two came into the match knowing like we've got jump serves, this team sides out. Well, we got to crank it. Yeah. And, and not, it does take a lot to be able to teach yourself, you know, not just to hit a top spin serve, but be able to like go line to line, hit the seams and whatnot. Cause I love passing top spin serves when they're in my wheelhouse, but when you got someone that can smoke your, your seam and your, your middle, you, you know, server seems just a race to where the ball's going and angling the platform the faster. The ball goes to a spot you're not in harder it gets. So, so no, that's to your point. It's, it's subjective. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, and, some players might really naturally understand their forearms. Like I, I think of a player that I've been coaching the last couple of years who of all the things she had, she came and her platform was just beautiful. Um, and at the same time, I think her arm swing took a little bit longer. And I get other kids that can crank their serve pretty easily, but passing takes a long time. So um, yeah, it just kind of depends on, on who you're working with. Yeah. Great question. And guess what? I got more, <laughs> dude, I got another one. All right. So let's go. Um, I guess more to the late junior scene or, or the adult scene uh, and how this question could be ap um, um, applicable. Um, so basically just getting to the point. 
what is the easiest fundamental that indoor players bring to the beach? Now, it's a loaded question because sometimes <laughs> it really depends on the position. So allow me to go first on this one. And then, and, and then the 60 second thing, I'll make sure I pick one. All right. Sure. Um, so I, I guess if you're a libero, right, like the easiest thing that transition is going to be serve receive and because now you don't have to pass to a target. You just have to pass high enough uh, where it's in front of the person where the, the hitter doesn't lose their, their, lose their court vision, as you um, uh, asserted in the last uh, under the last question about losing their court vision, which I didn't I didn't mention. Um, but then. I had a, a guy named Uche who, who, you know, who played in in Europe, um, who's on my coaching staff with um, LA Volleyball Club, and he wants he wanted to get more more beach in. So I set up this group, you know, and I mean this monster group. Guy from Fiji flew in, you know, some of the guys I practice out here locally. Max States play for Pepperdine, and this guy brought the one thing that felt like court freedom. So I'm gonna do this first, and you could you could have fun with everything else. And for him, it was the block because he didn't have to worry about blocking lanes he didn't have to worry about you know you know what i'm saying like zones and covering this and that somehow even though it was a one block and two or three or four he had this unlimited freedom to go after the hitter and and the sand didn't really limit his mobility because it was he didn't need an approach for it he's and he's always he's also six nine too so you can't teach height in that so just for fun because I know this question could be answered by, by our, our followers and you and me so many ways. I will finish by saying the block. The floor is yours, buddy. Yeah. Uh, I like that answer for the record. That, that would have been one of the choices I would have thought of. Probably, and ironically, mm. probably the serve. Um, you know, obviously the court is a little bit smaller in doubles now. Um, so, so that might be a little bit of a factor. Someone that has a jump uh, serve, whether it's float or topspin, I think because you broad jump a little bit more, um, as I saw the Ken Steffes interview, so I know he would disagree. I feel that most normal athletes can't broad jump in sand the same way uh, they can in indoor. Um, so I think spacing wise, a lot of tossers get the ball in front. So they're too far in front uh, when they contact. So they can't get their core uh, and contact point down. Um, but as a whole, um, if you've got a good, you know, I've, I've seen, players come in from high level D one programs and they don't have a lot of sand background. They don't have their hands yet passing, you know, it's similar, but the angles are different because when we pass the zone seven in indoor, we're usually drop the shoulders and in sand, I'm a little more up and down. I want to get a little more lift on it. Um, hitting, obviously, I think some hitters can, can translate that pretty similarly. Uh, but obviously shot work is, is that takes a little bit more time. I might argue, the shots uh, for someone that is a seasoned indoor player might be one of the hardest things. You know, that wasn't one of the answer. Uh, but I think a, a serve for, for someone that's got a good control of their serve in indoor, mm -hmm. um, if they understand how to use in doubles, I think they can put a lot of pressure. And again, you, you if all you do is side out decent and serve to put pressure and get the other team out of system, you know, you can lack some of those defensive skills and still compete. Um, but you got to be able to put, you know, if the other team, can't get any pressure on them. They side out at will. Yeah. Uh, that's really struggle. Well, I have a friend, uh, KJ, Chris Johnson. Um, he tried his hand in beach with Chris Austin and some other people. And he had this serve down the middle in, 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 in a beach volleyball game that would just change change the if it were indoor it would change the room temperature and and it translated so well outdoor also to add to, add to the fact that outdoor indoor you have that third passer in the middle so so you know you have to kind of have that little right hand just curve if you're going to have whatever or, or the serve to space has to just be so mind-blowingly whatever but he had the same speed of the serve indoor and only and a two-man passer and all of a sudden uh, this ton of real estate in the middle that even serve received like i was watching the cbva open and it was cervantes and his partner they actually literally tightened their two-person group to here and, and it was still whoosh 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 so i i, I like that I, li I really really like that and i'm very very interested in what some of the other people you who are watching this episode might have to say right because again for outside hitters and liberos maybe serve receive and just like ball control and just knowing where they are is is, is easier for them because they were Service see they're kind of playing de facto doubles anyway, you know, or I mean, you got that third person or whatever, but um, yeah, and the mat just imagine that serve and imagine it, you know, a lot of the serves where you you, you can't really pass with your hands on the beach, uh, yeah. um, unless you're a miracle worker, you're not going to pass some of these serves with your hands, it's going to be forearms. So, and, you know. and we're not even getting into if you get someone with a good jump serve and the <laughs> wind is against them, yes. They don't even have to. Uh, you know, there was a team in Chicago, Joe Smallzer, mm -hmm. 
and George Camberos. Joe Smalls was a two-time national server of the year at Loyola. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was one of the players when, when they were winning championships. 6'8", lefty, snaps yeah. the ball, unreal. Mm-hmm. And, Cody and George Camberos yeah. was maybe 5'11", uh, but started as an outside for, for uh, Loyola back in the day. Now, that's a team that that on a good day, like when they're missing their jump serve, like a 2014 beat them in the semis of Bollywood, which at the time was a big tournament. And it was a one game or to 30 uh, for that tournament. And we won 30 to 15 um, because they couldn't make their serve. But I remember another match in a semi um, and they were both cranking their jump serve and we lost 21 seven in the first game. Like, yeah, it, you know, you want to talk about when you have a skill working for you that, that can have a completely different, I don't, I don't think I ever played a pair now that I say that out loud that my biggest victory against and my biggest victory or, or you know, defeat had that type of, you know, uh, disparity. I mean, mm-hmm. to go from losing a game by 15 or 14 and then winning one a couple months later by 15, um, you know, that's just kind of where it goes to show. But man, yeah, when, when Smallser was hitting his jump serve, right. It was just, I, I don't, that guy probably could have aced anyone even on the AVP tour. Like it was just, he was contacting so high. He could snap it from, you know, zone one, basically but he was lefty and cut it across. And if the wind was right, he could put it almost 10 foot line sharp. And then you cheated over there. He could just bang it down the middle. Um, you, you literally had to hope that he wasn't going to get a hold of the right serve in the place that you were, were you know, you tried not to guess, but you know, when it's a certain speed, you kind of have to to anticipate if he's hitting both, um, you know, pretty well. So nice. Yeah, pretty gnarly. Cool. All right, hey. So topic three, we got a, a more difficult question, and, and maybe sixty seconds might not be enough time to pour through it, but it's definitely um, a lot. Some of your time for this, but I'm going to ask you first. You're going to go first on this one. We're both juniors coaches, so this is for the juniors coaches. It's for the juniors players and juniors parents out there, as well as college recruiters. Here's the question. For juniors, what are three things that you remind your players and or parents um, what college coaches may be looking for? I mean, I've question. Got five and five only. All right, let's because do I it. Think, I think I think we, we have a lot of myths because there are, you know, I can get myself Ready? four profit companies. Yep. Go ahead, babe. Yours. Five things. The first three totally took from Pat Powers. So, so you know, giving credit where it's due. Number one. Are you good enough? Like, do I look at you and you're either at that level or I look at you and think if you're trainable, uh, that you can get to the level that our program needs to be successful, that you're going to make our program better. Number two, um, are you coachable, right? Um, There's a lot of kids that have talent, but if they come from a different system and they're not adaptable, that's not going to work. So, you know, if you are a kid that I think needs some work compared to where you are right now to get to the level that I want to recruit, are you coachable? Uh, number three, how do you deal with adversity? Uh, you're not going to play at the collegiate level without getting challenged from time to time, whether it's obviously dealing with trying to earn playing time on the court or, you know, playing a team that, that you know, we're trying to compete, whether it's to win just that match, whether it's to win conference, whether it's to win, it, um, you know, the, the big tournament. So, you know, when things get rough, are you the type to rally the troops or are you the type that's going to point the finger? Are you more worried about protecting yourself, right? And then the fourth and fifth, I add that if you're really good, sadly, probably isn't as important as it should be, is, you know, what's your character like? Uh, do I have to worry about you on a weekend where you're not in the program? Are you going to be something that becomes a problem for our program? And and for me, if you're not a scholarship athlete, what are your grades like? And I say that I know if you can't afford to go here, you're not going to come. Or if another school is more cost effective. So, you know, looking for a kid and being realistic, I'm like, okay, they got the level but I know that we're not going to be able to offer them the financial package that someone else might. Um, those are things. Those are the five things that matter. It doesn't matter what recruiting combines you go to. It doesn't matter what showcases. It doesn't matter what club you play for. It doesn't matter what club tournaments you won. It doesn't matter what stats you have. Do you pass the eye test? Are you right. what we're looking for? Do you, do you fit the mold of our program? And I think parents and players that focus their, their efforts, every dollar you spend on club sports should be focused on your development. Because, you know, you see it in the NBA, a lot of people that get drafted, it's not because they're a finished product. It's because the coaches look and they look at whether it's their wingspan, their reach, their physicality, um, their growth in college if they started playing at a late time. Um, I was like, man, I wasn't what talking that long. That? I was like, <laughs> no, let me see if I can get rid of that. What the hell is oh, that? Yeah. Oh, good brother. Um, well, I'm glad we yeah. 
Glover. <laughs> it's not even supposed to expire in 10 minutes. I'm not. <laughs> we, we coach a sport that's all about yeah. adaptations. We can adapt to that. So, so, you know, point being is, is you know, so many p- I, I have a parent that did a private with me. I've got a daughter that's hardworking in an hour. We improved three things that all year she, she felt that she wasn't getting. They paid $8,000 for their club season. And all the majority of that money is travel tournaments, hotels, right. airfare. What those things aren't is something that definitively takes your kid from here, then to here, then to here. So I just think too many families get sucked into the 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 notion that it's it's all about the competitive experience, travel and being seen. When with the gift of the internet now, if if you put the work in and everything you do is focused on just becoming the best individual player you can be. You know, you could send a private email to a coach with a private YouTube link of you just doing skills in the right way in a, another gym that that's just whether it's a scrimmage with people local or within your team. And if it shows the right things, you're going to have a better chance of being recruited than the kid that isn't as good as you, but did all those other things that are being sold to their parents. And players. Right. All right. Well, here's mine. Uh, um, and I, I didn't. um I actually rehearsed this question. I, I kept this question hidden so I could be more organic and at the same time be be wrong about all three of my points so people can chime in and we can have this discussion. The first thing I like to do, if, if we're talking about girls volleyball, their ability to play well with others, right? Camaraderie is one of the most important things in club volleyball and it, and, and it translates to college where leadership by performance more identifies with men uh, as far as the volleyball psychology thing is concerned. So their ability to play well with others. They could be the best player in the tournament, but are they kind of like isolated and not really messing with anyone and not not into you know not making about their partner just making it about themselves uh, uh coaches look out for that thing the second thing is the diva mentality right the diva as a term only exists because the player is good right if they were diva and they were bad they would no one would care no one would care about the term diva and it's not even applicable so coaches want to know if this person's a diva or not because right now there's so much of a, a recruiting talent that they're they're going for girls who have a little bit more humility uh, and, and are not man man children or women children in regards to that because there's right now because it's an NCAA sport there's just too much talent out there right um the third thing i think coaches are looking for is how they deal with the loss like i, I was i was coaching a uh, girl I'll, I'll leave nameless at the avp uh, first finals in hermosa beach and she had a complete meltdown after losing right and this happened in front of anna collier who was at the time she was being recruited to usc and then she kind of tried to blast at me and duran or whatever and it took everything i had to not kick her off the planet you know like uh, the at the at, at something i consider blatant disrespect you know um so their ability to deal with the loss, one, their ability to treat everybody the same regardless of stature, right? Because I got pissed at this girl because I was like, if that were Anna, she wouldn't have done that. She thought it was okay to do with me and she thought wrong I'm because I'm crazy. I'm loco. So, I mean, so, I mean, but only well, you're speak- the coach. Yeah, but only speaking. You, you don't have to agree with your no. coach and everything, no. but there's a, there's a way to address it mm-hmm. that, that's constructive yeah. versus, you know, again, like, well, my kids make a mistake. I'm never going to be like, hey, that was bad. Right. Right. Like I'm going to say it's like, hey, you did this. This was the result. So let's work on that. Mm-hmm. And and, you know, as a coach, I have to take that feedback. I, I had a practice this uh, summer with the, where uh, I had enough where we, we had just play. But I had one extra girl and I kept just taking one at a time just to kind of do an audit. Like, hey, how are you liking the camp? How are you liking your coaching styles or anything we could do different? Right. And and I actually had a couple girl like I had one girl. That brought up like you know we, we there's a certain arm warm up that we do and she's like when i do it my arm feels better but some practices it's not always in the rotation like boom like that was that was such good you know instead of being like hey sometimes my arm hurts because you don't do this it was like hey when you do this i get different results like that that's a that's a girl that's going to make a good coach if she chooses uh to, yeah. to join the fray right so i think it's important to 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 your point like you know that girl even if she wants to blame you which you know probably isn't the factor of the situation that there's a none way to, do with to me. address it yeah. look but, coaches but, but co- you know the crazy thing is coaches like always it. take that l but this one i was like dude because like look when your players lose uh, and i'll let you finish but when your players lose we as coaches always uh, self-examine what could we have done to make that situation different this is the only reason why i remember is because this is one of the rare occasions where i was like this ain't on me this one isn't on me man <laughs> sorry go ahead no you're good and uh, and like you know again I've, I've had players that have come to me not happy with the situation and and they're not accountable right 
So like we used to have a situation where we would have two courts, uh, eight kids is the most I'll put on a court. And we regularly had 13 to 16 there. Right. And, and some days my girl, uh, my, my, one of my girls would be, you know, number seven or eight. And so she would be on the, the top court. Now we, we rotated coats just every practice. So it was never like one practice. You only got to work with one or the other. Both courts worked on the exact same system, the exact same things. And then another practice, I might have more of my college bound athletes. So now she's number nine or 10. Um, and, and the issue we were having was she, when she was on the top court, she was the player she was capable of being from an effort perspective. Right. Right. Um, and, and, you know, what I tried to, to instill in my players before we even get on the practice, like when my, you join my program, you're not here to be judged among other people. You're here to get better individually. And my, like my, my part in that is I have to make sure every practice that, that no one's getting preferential treatment. Right. And, and we do that. Um, and the issue was when she would go on that second court where she should have been smacking everyone, she'd be feeling like she was demoted. And all of a sudden she's going 500 with kids that she is more, you know, and on paper, she should be beating, but her, you know, demeanor on the court changed. And, and so I would sit with her and her mom and, and be like, here are the things she needs to work on period. Right. But at the end of the day, I got more than eight studs. And, and if you don't want to be on the second court, like, can you understand what am I supposed to do if when you get put on that, that, that court and you don't play the way that earns the right to be on that first court, what, what do you want me to do? So I shift you over and then number eight on that court gets moved because you don't want to give the same effort on the second court. It doesn't work that way. And, and not a rude way, but like, if you think you go, you're going to go to college and let's say you start on the non-travel team for beach. Like I know there are, there are programs that have, a, that do absolutely train their, their travel kids. Cause that's the focus for that program. The focus is to win in college. Yeah. And so if you can't figure out how to give that first court effort, the second court here, I'm setting you up for failure. Right. So, right. But but the way they were coming to me was at least respectful, right? right. They weren't being accountable, but but the, you know if they had just told me, hey, you're do- I, I did I've had a parent that's like I don't agree with what you're doing. It's you know, and there wasn't a matter of like, hey, there's two perspectives here. It was like you're doing it the wrong way, and you should do it this way. Yeah. And I had to look at that kid at some point saying, I can't coach you because your mom's the paying customer, and it's clear that what our system is like. I respect that she doesn't vibe with it. But this, I don't compromise, you know. No, and uh, no, because you have later, other people that you have to answer to, right? Well, just, right. I it, mean, it's you know it, what it, that There's can other be other organizations. It could like, be no, but that person could be toxic to the people that you're you're you're, you're accountable well, to. Well, they but they won't because I don't. I'm not going to change certain right. things, right? Like so, but but even if, again, I I have parents. Sometimes I, I joke like as a coach, I'm kind of the attractive girl with a crazy personality because. Everyone like uh, not to be, I coach fundamentals well. Like it's not I've, I've had really good coaches that have trained me, and I've been doing this for about twenty years now. I never see someone make a mistake, and my eyes can't tell me was it their spacing, was it their timing, was their mechanics. Like there's always a reason. It's just angles, right? All right. So I I was um head coach at a Hunter College High School, the boys team there. So something, and this is this is related, so bear with me on this one. So something about Hunter High School led the nation for, um, or is continuing to lead the nation, the nation in two very important categories, cumulative SAT scores and Ivy League application acceptance. So I knew going in, like there are kids in science class, if they know more than the teacher, or if they think they know more than the teacher, they're not going to respect him. They're not going to have the same respect that they have for teacher that teachers that have a reputation and this and that. So, so uh, back to what we were talking about as far as what college coaches are looking for. They want to make sure that D- Dane Blanton wants to make sure that he's that you you talk to him the same way and the same respect that you talk to Gustavo, his assistant, or that you talk to the team manager or the equipment person and this and that. That's one of the one of the cool things about Dane. Um, one of the things that John Mayer never has to worry about because he, 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 he just recruits the right people. But the point I was trying to make was you don't want to put yourself, parents and kids, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you, you, you don't respect that person the same, but you got a healthy fear and because now you can't have a conversation. So, cause I, that's what I did for a little bit. I, I came, when I moved to California, I was crazy Jason. Like, uh, like if you think you could talk to me that per- that way and you're not going to talk to that person the same way, um, I'll snatch your soul. <laughs> so, so I had this, this kind of thing where 
um, I got the respect because they thought I was that if they said if they did something or they showed me attitude, I would blow them up, you know, and <laughs> and it sucked because it's not something that the, the coaches who had the revere and the respect had to deal with because they, they wouldn't do that in the first place. So that was one of the challenges, uh, the three challenges I, I, I wanted to mention about what coaches are looking for in players. Your reputation starts the day you decide to become a volleyball player, right? Very much like acting. Uh, um, so if you're an idiot, you know, when you're 15, and, but you're, 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 you're a born again citizen when you're 18, uh, uh, sometimes a coach might only remember who you were at 15. So, I mean, there's, there's so many levels and I just went so many directions with that, but it's all connected if you get my meaning. So, uh, yeah. you wanted to share a thought on that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, the zoom kind of got chopped off and I was kind of hitting a bunch of different points myself, but, but simply put, like, I think it's important and, and it's give and take. It's tough because, you know, when, when you're a college coach, it, it's tough when, when I coach division one. I got 16 girls that literally are the top 1% of their respective class, arguably, uh -huh. um, that are playing, right? And and some of them have gotten there. You know, some players played in an area where, you know, they were so far above their peers that they did kind of run the show. So they've had coaches that have bent the knee to them and their parents. You know, I mean, an ugly thing we don't talk about is like, there are a lot of kids that don't pay to play club, right? Because under the table, like the parents are told, Hey, if you play for our club, you won't pay a dime. It's the truth. So, so how as a college coach, that kid's going to respond to someone challenging them versus, you know, the kids that got to that level because they were in a system that demanded respect. You know, one of my, my dad was one of my best coaches, even though it was junior high basketball. And in the book I'm going to write, he's going to get about 10 pages talking about that experience. And one of the quotes I love um, that, that ties into what you says, you know, we're not, remember, we're, we're not, better than anyone but we're sure as hell not worse than them either and um what his point was and it was kind of both sides one don't ever let someone treat you like lesser right but at the same time recognize that you are not you know we might be better at different skills than other people but that doesn't make you a better or worse human being so to get 16 players that all come from different backgrounds all those backgrounds ultimately led to them you know when you're a kid playing juniors high school uh, juniors than high school playing in college is kind of the goal so you've all gotten to the same area successfully by different methods and now we got to get all those personalities to buy into one philosophy right and and you know it the challenge as a coach to, to create a healthy culture is even those players that might not be starters well they're very important for the culture of your team and and how do you find that sweet spot on you know preparing your starters to be successful against power conference competition while at the same time giving you know making sure everyone gets fed you know so that if there's an injury you're not like well that's the end of the season you prepare the next person up to do their job right um as well as just to your point like dealing with adverse moments because you're going to have you know slumps in in, in college season it's just very you're, you're not going to just go start to finish and not deal with adversity do we have people that when the rails are coming off or we're off the rails a little bit like we're not going to have people starting to just point fingers and, and become individualistic um, and, and can, you know, get back on track and say, OK, this didn't go the way we wanted. What's the root cause? We're going to work on this together and we're going to move forward. Together. And, nice. and that's that could be tough. Do we do we talk about in, in CAA uh, beach volleyball expanding the 16 teams? Did we have that conversation? Because that was going to be no. one of our debate questions. I had it before uh, with another guest, but because you, 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 your opinions are definitely um, different. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. It's a question that bears that 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 bears repeating. So I'm going to parrot this debate question uh, okay. for for one minute. So basically, um, from juniors to college. Stay with college for a little bit. The NCAA has expanded their, their playoff tournament to, uh, for beach volleyball to 16 teams. They have, however, um, made it single elimination. So with one minute to respond, I'd like your opinion on thumbs up or thumbs down on both of those categories and and as to the what and the, and the why. So the floor is yours, buddy. NCAA, uh, 16 teams, single elimination. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Go. Uh, both. You know, I think I think as a fan, it's going to make for more excitement because think about like that Georgia State versus TCU upset carries a lot more weight if it's just go home. Right. Whoa. So I think it's going to make for a more exciting, um, you know, 
I, I would feel very good if I was one of those smaller teams, but, but, you know, has the talent and, and it's a lot easier to beat a really, really good team once versus twice. Um, you know, for the teams that are a little stronger, just means you got a little more urgency on like, you can't have that match um, like that. I think anything that gives more opportunities um, to, to some of those schools that are not the bigger schools, I think that's going to make it easier for those schools to recruit because it's a little more realistic to say, Hey, our, our goal is to make the dance and they're capable. Um, and, you know, being objective from a business perspective, well, now you've got all these extra teams. Um, you know, how's that working with the budget? How are you, you know, those are things that I don't have in I've been out of the college game for about a decade now. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but I do, I'm always thinking about the sustainability of stuff. I, I do, you know, one thing we're not talking about as much, but Kathy DeBoer has brought up sometimes is, you know, if these college football programs that make a lot of money end up trying to separate from the rest of their um, athletics department, you know, a lot of that money is generated by the revenue sports. So as much as we're seeing the expansion in our sport, um, we want to make sure that we're building a model that if something happens to where the money's flowing right now, um, can, can we sustain ourselves? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I well, think as a fan, I love it. Um, but, but you know, I how it's going to work, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I, you know, the reason why I ask this question over and over again is because every time I hear someone's opinion, I flip-flop. The fact of the matter is, I'm a flip-flopper. My my mind, just like my underwear, is ever-changing, okay? And this time, it might be even three times a day because this place is boiling. So, with 45 seconds left to answer the question, like everybody else in the first part, thumbs up. 16 teams, some people say long overdue. I speak for John Mayer and a lot of people when they say it's about friggin' time, okay? Um, now, as far now for the difficult question, single elimination to double elimination. I was against single elimination because leagues like the AVP has shown that you can have 16 teams or whatever and still finish it out in three days because the NCAA is three days. But there's also this this excitement in almost every college sport about the single elimination that just makes it so exciting. Win or go home, like Georgia State TCU, right? Think of think of LMU beat UCLA, right? They come back, they they finish in the finals, but they might not have. Think of USC. When they got upset by, I think it was um, Florida International or Stetson or something like that. They got upset really early but came back and made it to the finals or closer to the finals again. So so I was against single elimination, but now, like, again, I'm changing my mind. It's I'm, I, I think I'm for it. There is this heightened level of excitement of win or go home in men's basketball, women's basketball. The women's uh, uh, beach, uh, indoor tournament is, is savage, right? And for men's volleyball, guys like you and me who played NCAA, like cry me a river, dude. Back when I played, there was only four teams invited to the NCAA, the EIVA winner, um, which by the way, I was invited, uh, I played at Hunter, but that year, Hunter, we were Division Three, but we were invited to EIVA, so that was pretty cool. Um, nice. Yeah, MIVA, MPSF, mm-hmm. and at large. That was back yeah. in the day. And now there's only seven teams. Oh, wow, dude. So so you're not going to hear too much sympathy be- they just stop, between Crimea and be Huh? Didn't the men's just expand to 12? Am I making that up? Um, like for 2024? I could be wrong on that. I, I, think, the men, I think the men's might have just grown. But yeah, I, no, I could be totally so, off on that. That's all right. Someone will comment. There ain't nobody so, going to pass. Does, your ori- it it only solidifies your original point. Like, yeah. you know, cry so me a river. Is- <laughs> For the guys, cry me a river. <laughs> what one thing to consider logistically about your, your comparison of like, well, the AVP does 16 teams in three days. But remember, each match is one court, right? right. So you, you can do that because you've got multiple matches happening at once. Well, to replicate that at the NCAAs, you would literally need three sets of five courts, right? Uh-huh. Because, because you know, every match, you need five matches happening simultaneously. And Gulf Shores had so that. If, if they set up, if so, so I'll just, you know, the question is a pr- promoter of this. Uh. Is, okay, if you do that, now you have to have 15 courts running at once. And are you diluting your crowd so that when you're showing the video, you know, it, it, are, do you have the fan base to not make that look more barren? I agree. Right? I and like, now you I got, like the two, three and now format. you got people that travel that have to choose at one given time. Well, I want to watch these teams, but they're playing at the same time, right? Yeah. Which we do see at the AVP sometimes that challenge. So I, I do think that um, I'm, I'm not saying you couldn't set up more courts. They don't have the space, but I almost think that the single limb, again, you want everyone focusing on that one thing. Cause you don't want to miss anything, no. uh, especially if you're trying to get fans to travel the country because you know, you, you, you 
your fan base there isn't people that are local, which is what most like people to travel for that. So right. the more you can give them in three days, feel like they're seeing everything versus like, man, I got to choose between watching this player at USC and this player at UCLA. Um, it, it, I think the single limb is going to make, it's going to make the easier for the fans to be more all around aware of what's happening. I like that. All right, so let's go to the uh, next lightning uh, round question. We are going from juniors to college and now to the pros. Uh, Phoenix Championship's happening, six six teams. I mean, we can definitely get into how. Uh, I, I mean, I'm hoping Madison and Rylan McKibben come out with a video and, to, and tell me how the six teams actually qualify, right? Because there, there are, I mean, like on the women's, I see Muno and, and Sarah Pavin, and that left me scratching my head. Like, well, they're uh, two uh, at large or two wild cards, right? Right. I guess so. Well, so, they, I, I guess it's like what is it? So it's like the three winners, uh, the goal series, and three um, three teams of points. I thought that, it was four for points and two wild cards, and I could be wrong on that. But I thought that was you. I thought it was four for the season because I remember right. going into Chicago, there mm-hmm. were multiple teams that to qualify had to have a certain finish, and yeah. Nelson Cloth took first, and that's what they needed to to be an auto bid, right? Yeah, and they were the only um, team that won two tournaments. So that also left me scratch in my head. They but they, but it. they had to. I think they had to win Chicago right to finish top four because I think they had a couple and that's lower. Just, fin- doesn't that feel weird? <laughs> that's that they're the only team that won twice. <laughs> like I mean, that's, every you know, every we, tournament had a different women's women's team winner. They're the only team that uh, won it's, twice. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good. You know, and it's going to make it that much juicier if if. April and Alex come back because I think the women's side is so much stronger than what it was when they were making their little run. And the gap is closer than everyone thinks. April and Alex, it, it, look, it, it, look, I, they I had think... this dominant performance in the Olympics that made it look like everybody was was eight points behind them. And 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 I think every team catches fire like that. But when you do it on the biggest stage, it it, it does create a mystique and an aura that you're you're significantly better than everybody else. Not to mention on the domestic scene, you know. Um, well, think about think about you know Clay's and Sponsel. Like they looked rough for a while. Remember, like yeah. they were doing great. And yes. then at one point it was like I remember you and I one of the podcasts you were you were we were talking about them, and and then I hope boom, I didn't like, name call. And, <laughs> I didn't yeah. name call. Did I? Did I ain't call nobody garbage? I didn't you name call. You just you were just being honest about how you felt. And they were in a rut. They were like there was a, there was a one to two month span right before they ended up winning that mm-hmm. one tournament and then ultimately qualifying, right. where where you would have been out of your mind to pick them. Yeah. because sponsor was having some side out issues and and they just their chemistry wasn't what it used to be and then boom yeah also they run and honestly like they could have made you know, a couple controversial points if they had won that match against canada i mean who knows what they would have done so you know yeah this game i mean this season's been such a good example of um you know the the what what at the highest level the difference can be because you know it's one of those things, even trying to pick who's going to win Phoenix. It's like, I I would, and again, for people that disagree, just understand, I, I'm, you know, he said, I'm a juniors coach that that follows it, but I don't watch it quite as much as, as the hardcore fan because I'm busy coaching and, and being in the arena myself. Yeah. Um, but but from what I've seen, like, let, let's talk about those top four pairs, right? So so you've got Hughes and Kalinske, you've got Sponsel and Cannon, you've got... Um, um, Chang and Flint, and then you've got Cloth and Nuss, right? And and people can disagree with this, but I feel um, Hughes, Sponsel, Chang, and Nuss are kind of the, the steady ones of, right. of those pairs, right? Um, and then you've got Cloth, Cannon, Kalinsky, and um, Flint, who at their best can be the best player on the court. And at their worst can be the factor on, on why that match didn't go their way. Um, and, and so it's interesting. It's been a really fun season to watch while I've, when I've watched because it, you really don't know. Like everyone's basements and ceilings are very um, kind of like the middle part of a, of a um, Venn diagram. Like I think everyone's pretty even on like their best can be someone else's worst or best on any given day right so i just i i think it makes it fun because you wouldn't surprise me i i'll say i i i would say on the women's side nothing to get your and skulls 
played great. Okay, that sort of wait, but dude, we got hold up. We gotta do our one minute thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna so. I was actually going to do teams to watch out for, but you know what? Um, since neither one of us are calling this match, and since it's fun to do this, and since we make it our place to pick winners when, whenever, and do whatever we want, let's 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 for the sake of volleyball and for the sake of healthy sports debate, let's pick some winners. And I, I'm I'd like to go first on this one. I'm, gonna go, uh, I'm just going to go finalist and this and, and and as to my why. Um, so let's start the clock. All right, so for me, I had a great conversation with uh, Sarah Sponsor yesterday. Um, we were just talking about um, some of the improvements that she's done on a personal level. Uh, also, having a partner where you don't have to deal with your partner, not casting any aspersions out on Kelly Clay's, but there, there is a much more uh, – she, she's playing with a certain a level of independence. Um, where she's having more fun out there because she's actually had some tournaments or whatever that even when she finished in the finals and won, it just didn't seem like fun. It just seemed like a miserable like atmosphere. But now it looks like she's loosened up and she's one of those players that doesn't have to have a mean look on her face to play well. There are some people that have to be a bitch to do that, right? And, and she's not one of them. She's one of those people she plays better when the mood's light. And for that reason, that's the reason why I think she's going to actually make the finals. But I don't think she's going to win the finals. And I think the best neutral ground team out out there right now in the AVP is Kristen Nelson Taren Cloth. Uh, if this game were in the South Bay, uh, Hermosa Beach, make mine the girls of 24th Street, right? Cannon and Sponsor. If it, if it were Manhattan Beach, exactly the same result which you saw in Manhattan Beach. Chang and Flint versus Kelly uh, Kalinski and, and Sarah Hughes, which that can go another way if they play tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. But as far as neutral ground teams, the teams that's always at the scene of the crime, the team that's the most isolated and prepared, I got Kristen Nelson Cloth over Sponsor and, and and um, Cannon, who, by the way, have been their kryptonite uh, on the last few months. Like, I believe they came out of the contenders bracket and won cause Chicago. I believe they came out of the contenders bracket and won Austin. And I also believe, if memory serves me correctly, both of those losses were to Sponsor and, and Cannon. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so who do you got? 60 seconds, buddy. 60 seconds. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. Any of the four teams at the top wouldn't surprise me. Skulls, Urango, I think they have to be at their absolute peak to be able to beat those teams on a regular basis, and they did for one tournament. Uh, but I think their basement's a little bit lower than the others. And uh, Pavin and Muno, like I like them individually, but again, it's a new partnership, and I think that matters. Um, weird. I would I would say that I, I my my gut is going with Hughes and Kalinsky for the reason that again of the four players I mentioned. I love Cloth and Cannon, and I think they're great for their experience level. They have the ability to win. And I, the scary thing is I think those two are furthest from their peak, right? Yeah. Uh, Flint and Kalinske, I think, are more the seasoned veterans of the, the second player. Of oh, he was in Kalinske, yeah. Um, well, no, no, I'm saying Kalinske oh, Flint and Chang. Flint. Okay. Like, no. Oh, Clint, got I'm, it. I'm comparing them got because it. I'm comparing number two. You know, I think Nuss is like Nuss – you know, she has her flaws, but like that girl was down for nothing. And I remember, I remember watching, you know, she'd already fought off a bunch of match points mm -hmm. to get to the final. They were down for nothing. I remember just watching her like smiling at close, giving her the look like, Hey, I don't know what's going on, but like, we'll figure it out. Right. Like she just, she's got that understanding that even when she, she's going to have those moments where she's going to have a couple points and you just never see her flinch. Right. So, so as much as my, my heart wants to pick those two, um, I love the fact that Nuss gives a lot of my undersized players someone to, to model after. Uh, but Hughes and Kalinske, I think Kalinske has some of the, the best upside of, of those four players. Uh, I think Hughes, Sponsel, um, Chang, and um, Cloth, all, all, or so Nuss, all have that ability to, to kind of take over matches. But right. I think Chang and Flint, when they're having fun, are, are oh, man. gnarly. Yeah. But I also think when they're a little off, mm -hmm. they get a little more testy, a little more Kobe, like you're not playing at the level I want, right? right. You kind of see that that the high fives are a little more aggressive. It's a little less, you know, hey, we're going to figure this out together. Mm -hmm. So so I guess I would, Hughes and Kalinske, Cloth Nuss, um, Sponsor Cannon, Flint Chang would be uh, the order. I would put them in with the understanding that that order can be blown up in any way. And I would is, be like, oh, is, I couldn't, and isn't I couldn't see it coming. And isn't women's volleyball so exciting right now? Like, 
me, uh, uh, look, I love volleyball in general, indoor and beach or whatever, but I always been micro, micro biased for the men's side because very much like, like baseball separated from fo- softball because of the elegance of a fastball. Right. Uh, um, because, uh, um, Indoor volleyball and beach, you know, what I'm saying the speed of the jump serve and this and that. I've always favored the men because the speed, the, the speed and living in a different matrix and being able to react under that speed is different. But with that being said, there's something about women hitting harder, women who are bigger right now at, at a, on a lower net and women still extending these rallies and making these long rallies on some of these impossible plays, not to mention just this time period where you watch games and you don't see too many women's games where they take plays off, right? If there's a line over, sometimes in a guy game, guys game, you'll see them take two steps. Ah, okay, next play. No, the the ball's hitting the ground and almost a second later, <laughs> a whole second later, that girl's hitting the ground after it. So there's this get after it volleyball that to me trumps all. <laughs> it supersedes all and get, and this is six worthy candidates like five of the six all, all, all have won a championship each right there, yep. there there was no there were no two two tournament champions until the end until Parody's close enough right it's good gradina and and hayward there was flint and chang there was Hughes and kalinsky there were spawn you know the i'm gonna call them the girls of 24th street sponsor and cannon I'm, I'm not trying to give away their practice or where they practice uh, uh like you said it's fun volleyball man and and who runs the world girls is, there, is it because <laughs> it, it why is uh did you have any idea the the one thing i was admittedly surprised with the wild card is like gradina and and yeah uh howard like were they you know i know muno i feel like muno and i'm not not like good player but i feel like no. she's getting pushed a lot by the association right yes so I, I, so and, we don't, and i don't want and, and I don't, no but I we're very no there. but we're very Let's careful no but yeah. we're very careful not to be mad at the prom queen but but definitely question the the, the voters i'm not i'm not mad it's just very like grandina and and yeah howard it's it's hard for me to understand why they wouldn't have been number six because for the point I mean yeah. imagine if you could say all six one one. Like Howard's... You, like the storyline was there. So I just wonder, was one of them unavailable? Was yeah. you know That's is, a good question. And no, but the A V P No, but let's that... just call it what it is. The A V P has been every time I see a, a thirty second clip. It's Muno. <laughs> but, Every but, time I but, see a highlight, it's Muno. And I like it because that is a good looking girl and she's a she's a worthy player. She's worthy to be in this six, but let's not put ourselves in a position where we're we're calling it what it is, but at the same time afraid what people people think we're we're chopping this one person down. We're not I'm not talking about the player, I'm talking about the game. Well, and, <laughs> you know? and let me let me clarify like I'm being curious because for all we know, the AVP extended the opportunity for Grodina and how and they didn't take it because maybe right. they've got an international tournament, just conflict, Oh, you're talking whatever, about maybe. that. Okay. Got yeah, so so I'm just saying like I I can't sit here saying like for all we know, Muno and Pavan or Pavan were not the first choice yeah. uh, to be that sixth spot. So so it's it's genuine curiosity. Like that's just the team that I was kind of anticipating, right. and I was shocked when that. Don't uh, you, but don't we don't we love us some Harvard though? Haley uh, Harvard, man, this girl looks the like best athletes probably in Florida. I had Carolyn and, Wopat. And just getting started. I had Carolyn yeah. Wopat as far as like physiques are concerned. I had Carolyn Wopat on the podcast, and I, I'm gonna say the love same her, thing about the about Harvard. I'm gonna that I said about Wopat. It's the it's the it's the girl you want your son to date, but not your daughter to fight. <laughs> That's hilarious. So. And when Kristen. she sang the Star Spangled Banner, when they said when they told me a volleyball player was singing the Star Spangled Banner. I went, I said, you better be good. What? You, 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 uh, here we, I, I, look, I'm, I'm a hater. You know that. I'm Hater Jay sometimes. I'm like, oh, here we go again. She's, we get this girl that's, we get this person that's good at this one thing and it automatically translates that she's supposed to be good at everything else. And I said, man, she better be good. Brian, she was awesome. Yeah. She was awesome. I went, I went like this. And that when she sang the Star Spangled Banner. And, and I mean, look, Tina, I don't even need to talk about my love for her. I mean, her godfather is my mentor, Aldous Lucis of Latvia, uh, her god who lives in Latvia, who has taught me how to coach uh, from the neck up. So I, so I already have love for Tina. But Haley, man, that would have been so cool. You're right. You're right. Let's do the men. Let's do the men because I know you got a hard stop somewhere. You got, you got real work to do. I got the house. I got the, I got the studio to myself today. So let's go men. I'm going to put a hard stop at 215. 
right. so through 30 minutes for me. all right i like it if not zoom will do it for us right <laughs> <laughs> so let's go with men um did you you're gonna go first on this one who are our finalists who do you got uh, this is gonna be probably my shortest 60 second one you might actually keep me at the time you know t2 try and trevor are the only pair that were seasoned going into this season right i love the the personnel um on the other teams but that's the one team that that you know went into 2022 kind of having a foundation and i think their play has kind of shown in specifically the last couple of tournaments too i know they had kind of a no that is always people over here they had a couple of bad tournaments and i'm watching the online forums people are saying it's time for them to break up blah 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 and then you know they say no way Idiots. um who they're gonna play in the final it's hard to go against Phil when he's not playing with Sutton. So, you know, you, you don't know what he's going to bring to the table. So I, I've never bet against Phil. Uh, yeah, but, there's you that. Know, you know, the Taylors are, are seem pretty hungry. Um, I'm not, not as big of a fan of the personalities. That, that's it, We're going to probably have a conversation about the state of beach right now, and I'll segue to that later. But, yeah, I think uh, – Try and Trevor. I mean, that's ones. why we're here, right? That's why we. Yeah. That's why we're on so the podcast. Try and Trevor versus Phil and, and Casey. I can see that being the final if, if the All right. brackets align. All right. So very much like you, I'm going to go with the easy part. I like trying Trevor as a heavy favorite to win that, and and heavy favorite in the AVP uh, is is a rarely ter- uh, used term the last couple of years. What does that say? Ten minutes. Yeah, you just right. keep keep keeping captive. Yeah, 40. that's all right. We'll do that. So um, you want to do one more? No, let's keep going. I want to finish okay. this minute, but. I like them because not only have they improved significantly, not only have they matured in many ways, but they their psychological highs and lows and when to talk crap and this and that almost seems telegraphed. It almost seems uh, uh, with a purpose. It's not done out of emotion. It's almost like the way they navigate their emotions against other teams is now it's tactical, right? They, they beat Evan Corey because of that, you know, and they beat the Taylors because of that. Not to mention, they got an upgrade in coaches. Jose Leola, uh, I never considered like a real coach, but I consider him a winner and, I, and someone that knows the game. And but Leandro right now, their new coach, this man is, is out of all the Brazilians that came to the United States between him, Pompeo, Arturo, Arturo uh, um, he, he is an absolute beautiful mind. And everything that guy touches turns to gold. So he's been, and I know they weren't winning tournaments in the beginning with him and they got upset by the, by the 16th seed in Hermosa Beach. But I told people, I'll wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And ask, ask me what I won, Johnny. I won Try and Trevor. And I think they're going to win this time. Now, who they play against? I'm going to go Miles Partain and Paul Lottman. I think it's a very brave pit. I, that, pick i say never bet against phil but it looks like miles partain uh, uh, as far as we had this conversation about who's going to push phil off the cliff or right earlier in this season i think miles actually raised my hand and said i'll do it uh, you know with the greatest and utmost respect that i know how and i'm going to do it with my left and i'm going to do it on the option and i i it's going to be a toss-up between them and taylor and, and taylor uh as far as having the right to, to get their head chopped off by trying trevor but but um I, I like making these bold predictions because if I'm wrong, I'd have, I could have a conversation, and it's okay to be wrong. But it's, uh, I think people are, oh, are guessing. I think people, like no, but day, I think people didn't... are playing themselves if they if they're not thinking the same thing we are. The only difference between you and me and the other people is we're saying it out loud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and just you know, anytime I make a prediction, it's mm-hmm. a prediction. Like that's why we. That's a beauty of sports mm-hmm. because we've seen this season sixteen seasons beat one team, you know, one season. Even when the percentages say, like, there's no way, you know, 99.9% of the time that doesn't happen, it's not zero, right? No. So there's a I reason why we play. Like, why did the right, Giants play the Patriots, right? Why did the Giants play the undefeated Patriots? Because yeah. there's a handful so, of people who thought they were going to win that game. So, you know, that's why, like, I think anyone that that takes, you know, or acts like, oh, they shouldn't have. Well, that's that's the beauty of it, because you just don't know that day who's who's on fire, who had a good day, you know, good night of sleep, good nutrition dealing with adversity well that day. There's just so many variables that we don't get to see behind the curtain. And and again, there's some days where I remember looking at my partner being like, man, everything's going right and it shouldn't be. Like we're, we're, we're kind of struggling with some things and just the ball keeps trickling our way. There's other times where you're like, man, I can't do anything else. And it's just every tape serve goes their way. Every ball seems, you know, just just some days the little things go your way or, or the other. So, and that's, that's why we watch. That's, that's what makes it fun. 
Right. Cool. So let's do lightning rounds just just for you, because from from this point out, everything's going to be about you. These lightning rounds are about us because you and me, we we go head to head and we debate and sometimes we agree and disagree. But for all intents and purposes, I want a 60 second light, lightning round, just you quick answers. And then I want to find out you what you know, what you've been up to the last couple of year, couple sure. of years. So let's do lightning round. We go to one minute and it'll start because the most the first question will probably be the longest one to answer. So I'll do a start. I'll, I'll do a start when you start talking about it. So right. best conditioned partner you, that you played with as a player. Oh, uh, Maxime Gladoon is currently on the Ukrainian beach national team. I, I had four really nice. physical partners all touched over 11, but, but Maxime yeah. six, five, probably 40 inch first. Who's the, okay. Who's the most angry player you played with? I was the angry partner, man. <laughs> I don't look Kobe to me. Cool. The um, player, yeah. This is the lightning rounds. The player you look forward to playing the most. Kalinsky and Buckley beat me 14 straight times before I finally got them, but that was the team for two years that pushed me to keep raising the bar for myself. Cool. And it was always exciting to see how much closer I got. What's your go to food? I, I, I don't have a lot of money. Box mac and cheese, man. Shout out to Goodles. Look yes. at Goodles. Um, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter? I've seen more uh, Lord of the Rings as a Harry Potter got stood up in high school story. So I'm sure I would like Harry Potter, but I just, I don't go back to it. Shakespeare or Scorsese? I, you know, I had to read Shakespeare. I chose to watch Scorsese. So I'm going to go with the movies. Nice. Um, now I asked you this before, last good book you read, but you're an avid reader. So what was, what was the book you've been reading I, recently? I've not been reading, like I haven't been able to finish a book lately. I've been chipping away, but I, I'm actually coaching a girl. Her dad is, uh, Rich Horwath. He does a lot of, um, strategy books for, okay. for businesses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he, he actually, I, I got a book of his and I'm about three chapters in and it's, it's fantastic. So, nice. uh, kind of cool to, to know the author too. And, um, yeah, so so um, I should look for the name of the book. Shame on me! I don't think I've got it uh, off the top of my head. It should it's probably on my uh, nightstand. But yeah, Rich Horowitz has written a couple. I think it's um, you know strategy for business principles. But he, he's great. Look him up. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm reading Scars and Stripes right now by Tim Kennedy. Um, and Tim Kennedy is a former MMA fighter, but more importantly, a former Green Beret. So um, when he started, when he when he retired early, good for him, no brain trauma. He did this reality thing called Finding Hitler, where he went to Argentina to like find out where some of these Nazis who retreated from their trial or whatever, and this and that. And then I found out, you know, after m knowing more about him, I found out like he's on the terrorist um, uh, blacklist or whatever. He lives in a gated community. Like he's he's done some. Let's just say he's done some bad things to some people who had it coming, and and um, I I really like his his bet on yourself go getter mentality, right? Like, so there are some people who who bad things happen to them, but it's like, what are you gonna do about it? You know what I'm saying? Do do you do you do you go drinking? Do you do you do you drown in your own self pity, or do you do you do you pick it up immediately from volleyball from a wheelhouse, right? Like Evan Corey, right? Didn't miss the playing game in Atlanta. Did he just drink in Atlanta and spend the whole weekend? No, he got his ass on a plane. He went to Seaside, literally was thrown on the court from the plane in the first set they lost and won the whole thing with Logan Weber, which was a a, a main draw bid spot for Chicago. So, so there's a lot about this guy about not about not what's already been done, but what are you gonna do now that that I really really admire and and um and I bought his book for that because I know he's got I know he's got a bunch of stories to tell. He's a very very interesting person. Ex Green Beret. Um, kind of a Republican space ranger, but, but, um, <laughs> when you think about it, like there's no decent human being that's completely left or right. So when you think about like all of the, all of the qualities that like Republicans like about the left and all of the, all of the qualities that the left might like about Republicans, uh, um, this, this healthy balance, you know, like, um, he, yeah. He's a, he's he's a, a uniter. He's a guy that that wow. Our differences actually make us uh, um, our differences make us more closer. You, you sure. know because because he offers something that I don't bring to the table. You know that nice. I could you that I could use help at right. You know to quote Black Black Panther is more about us that that brings us together than 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 separates us. And sure. and I bring to you Tim Kennedy. I also bring to you Brian McDermott. <laughs> So progression beach volleyball, Brian, when did you start it? 
Dude, was it two years ago? Oh, 2014, man. Built, 2014. built my facility to the 18th was a three year mark from our facility open. Yeah. I started progression. Uh, it was actually more for college guidance. Yeah. 2015, I had the opportunity to uh, oversee two courts in the area. So it started to shift to the beach. And it was originally progression volleyball consulting. And then we turned it into progression beach volleyball once we had an environment that allowed us to make that the focal point of the business. So, yeah. But, so yeah, what? Beach, beach for about seven years. So the last two years, let's just go to the last two years or close to the last two years. What, what are, what are one or two things that you saw a significant like improvement, um, in progression beach volleyball, as far as, um, the direction that you wanted to go? Um, you, I guess you, uh, I, I don't know if you had an intention going in or if you just put this together and then, and then your attention and your mission statements changed, changed or, or, or evolved. Uh, um, as as the club evolves, so give me maybe one or two things that you you saw significant change in for the better. I like I like the way you sculpted that because I'm tired of talking about the tough times. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it has been tough. Um, you know, and I'll try to give the short answer on this because I know time is limited. Um, clubs have changed a lot in the last couple of years in our area. Um, they they've now ran their tryouts in July. And this year, because they had a little more time, like kids finished nationals and then there was open gyms for about three weeks and then there were tryouts. So so the elephant, That's the hilarious. challenge, um, but but we'll talk about the, the good part. The challenge was, I mean, it gutted our, our summer program. It was a rough summer. We, we did not have a lot of kids. And the scary thing that I saw in our area is even the clubs that had big beach programs. I feel like the clubs collectively recognize, you know what? we don't want to share the space from our business model with another version of our sport. So even the clubs that were starting before there were July tryouts and beach was a way for them to get revenue that they wouldn't normally have from their kids. Well, now that we can use those same months to generate our revenue for indoor, let's push beach to the side. So our region had a big drop in participation. Even my tournament directors that do a good job, they were struggling The the positive of that, um, I, while I didn't want to make it an ultimatum, um, we, we've been trying to build a, we're blazing the trail here. And I wanted to create a version of our program that gave families the opportunity uh, to have flexibility and play multiple sports. So with the pandemic, it was it was crazy for me to try to do it, but we were letting people pay a deposit and then they sign up practice to practice. And that was the right intent. I think it got us where we had to in tough times. But the challenge with that was, um, you know, I had kids that were dedicated to do that. They wanted to do beach exclusively. And then they had kids that were there. They weren't there. They were So practices were, were very sporadic on what to expect. So, so this change has forced me, we, we just launched it this fall. Um, we're doing it kind of like at best of both worlds. So right now we're in week three of a 10 week program. So it's twice a week uh, that we train. And then five times in that 10 week span, we're going to play in house. We're going to do two different versions. We're going to do uh, queen of the beaches where they have eight individuals. You're going to play six matches with five different partners. It's just a way to get a lot of gameplay in uh, and allows the coaches to kind of see when we're not coaching them, what are they retaining so that we can make sure our practices are, are directly related to what these kids are showing us that their areas of improvement are. Um, and we'll also do some four pair round robins. So it's not going to be an all day thing. Uh, it's going to be in-house. Um, and, and so it's nice because these kids get the competition that I think we have. We've been very developmental focused, but I do think a lot of our girls in season would like to, to play more like actual wins losses. So um, we're going to do another one in November that goes until the first week of February. We'll do a break in February until March, and then we'll do until mid-May, and then we'll take a couple of weeks off, and then we'll do our summer. So what I'm excited for is I think what we've created is with indoor, the challenge is, is every 10 to 12 players I add to my program, I need a new coach. And ultimately, the, the paradox of running a club, it, it, this is why it's not, I'm not anti-club, I'm pro-family. And the challenge of running a club is the bigger you get, the weaker you get. I, I don't care how much you care. You just, if you get past 20 teams, you're not going to have a lack of disparity between your top and bottom coaching. And it's a program that essentially um, kids that don't make their ones teams, this is my opinion, are playing for a program that is literally, if they've got a better ones coach than the lower coaches, you're paying to be held back from the kids you're trying to catch. And that's mm. a challenge that we don't talk about. Yeah. With Beach, you know, I've got the same coaches 
Like I work with every group that hops into our program. So the beauty of it is my kids that are a twos, threes, four teams level as they start in beach are getting that ones team experience, right? And, and the first three weeks I've got mostly in the fall, I've got, you know, this is a time where the kids I'm working with, the ones that didn't make their high school team or had a negative enough experience in a toxic environment in their high school, they chose not to play. And boy, has it been fun to work with these kids that honestly, I don't think have ever gotten quite this level of instruction. And, you know, at first you see the shoulders up after mistakes. And now what we're getting to see is, is kids are really, you know, once you stop punishing them, benching them, they're not, they're there to not compare, compete against their peers. They're there to be the best they can be. And these people are simply there to help, you know, show the things they need to get better at and, and to, to work with them on it. Yeah. And um, so I think this is a, a youth sports model indoor on the one game in town that could look at parent and player in the eye and say, I don't care what level you are. This is exactly the coaching you're going to get. This is exactly the environment you're going to get. Like that there's no, if you get this coach, you're going to have this experience. If you get this coach, you're going to have a different experience. And um, yeah. So, so that's been really good. And um, recently, number two thing is, is um, coach Jordan. I've, I've for 16 months, I did everything with the pandemic. So I had to do every phone call, every email, every text, every rental, every lesson for 16 months. There wasn't a, a bit of labor for progression that I didn't do. Uh, one of my parents said it. I was dry. I was changing the tire on a car that was still moving. And uh, I, I'm still working through my burnout. I'm going to be honest with it. Um, but there's, like I said, getting closer to the end of my pipe in Shawshank. And um, Jordan has been part-time with us the last six months. She was a GA at North Park University. She's, she's 23 or I think she just turned 23. Um, just, just cares about kids, cares about coaching, hard worker, smart. Like I would be, I, I wrote this. I mean, it would be a privilege to have Jordan in my inner group of friends. And she is hopping on, in my opinion, to, to be my right hand person, ultimately probably to run that facility because my long-term goal is to do more content creation and more, macro stuff um and and it's really the first time in in a couple of years that i've had the juice to start expanding my program to where it needs to go because it's taken me so much just to maintain in this climate um i'm, I'm finally at a point where i i can have a second person helping me and it's, it's to have someone with her character is a blessing her work ethic is amazing and and Again, I've, I haven't been able to go watch my kids play high school because I've had to be at the building anytime there's coaching. Cool. And last week, um, she was able to take care of it, and it was awesome. So yeah, I, I feel like it's been kind of a, I don't want to say like a reverse parabola because I don't think we've been going down and down. I feel like we've been here, and I can finally see the uptick, which makes me super happy. So yep. yeah, we're, we're, we're looking good. I'm excited. Dude, dude you're four freaking minutes behind, man. Let's, let's plug in your, um, your, your website and your IG a little bit yeah. so the people so, want to, who want to know a little bit more about progression of course we got to do that yeah so so progression beach volleyball um write a lot on our blog at progressionvolleyball.com um my facebook group i i'm gonna start doing some live streams on it eventually you and i'll be talking so i'll definitely be having you on for it too yeah um help help me know, work out the codec man because i'd like to do that more so good. and and look if you're watching this you're a parent you're a player you're a coach if there's things about you sports or just technical training in general reach out to me because a lot of my blogs are inspired by talking to parents and players and me talking to them and saying, you know what, this probably is something that more than just that family feels and it should be addressed. And I don't think it's addressed a lot. So um, progression volleyball on, on uh, Instagram. I think it's progression BB. I'm, there it is. I had to start doing my social media, but I've started to like, it's been cool because I've been able to go to these high school matches. So I take a picture of my kids and, and, you know, I don't care about wins and losses. You're not going to hear me talk. We had a, pair that won a national championship at a, a beach tournament this summer. We have girls so going good. to college. I just like talking about my girls and their growth, my players and their progression, right? So, you know, I like telling the stories about the kid that two years ago I couldn't get to just talk. And now she's a senior on her high school team and she's the captain. And and her parents have said how confident she sees them, not just on the court, but off the court, right? The the girl that, that didn't believe in herself and, and came to us and after – playing 11 sets in a tournament and not being allowed to play a single play. Um, you know, now she's on the number one team in her class in the state and she's starting on that team eight months later. So uh, it's not about the success because not all my kids are going to win tournaments or whatnot, but um, I'm really enjoying making sure all my players know, Hey, if 
you started here, you put the work in and you got yourself here. I, that's a win to me. If you're doing the best you can individually do, I'm proud of you. And I hope when you leave volleyball, uh, that some of the things that we were able to help you deal with helps with your education relationships and your careers. Nice. Mr. McDermott, you are a beautiful mind. And we're going to hit my music. Guys, this is episode. <laughs> we're leaving. <laughs> this man's <laughs> got to get to work. This is episode 151, the Option Podcast. That, my, nice. that is my man, McDermott. I'm going to hit my music. And we are. Thanks, people. We're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on optiondb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.